Shabbat Shalom. Oh, yes, yeah, Shabbat Shalom to y'all too. Shabbat Shalom, Mishpacha, Hag Sameach, Hag Pesach Sameach, Hag Matzot Sameach, Hag Bikrim Sameach, since they're like all in a row <laughs> this year. Friday, Shabbat, Sunday. Amen. So, man, this is going to be. I got a lot to say, but my brain's not working. You want to start this off? So this is going to be our uh, first fruits teaching, our our bikurim teaching. Uh, the title that we've we've given it is first fruits. All that I have is his, and we're going to get into all of the scriptures that pertain to the grain offering and the especially the first fruits offering. And we're gonna we're gonna really cover and tie in how it really represents that you know this whole process, this whole offering in itself means it, it symbolizes that everything that Israel ever had, every provision, every every single grain, every single fruit, everything that he gave them in the land belonged to Yah, but he gave it to them. Okay. And, and uh, it's the same for us today, Mishpacha. Everything that we have, every good thing that comes. Uh, from above is, is what James says. Every good thing we have comes from above. So um, that's what we're really going to dig into with this message. We pray that it's encouraging to you guys. We pray that you guys are having a, a blessed Pesach uh, matzo feast. I uh, hope you guys, whether you did Pesach last night or the night before, hope you guys had a blessed Pesach meal and um, you experienced Yah's presence. And uh, we pray that you just continue to experience His presence throughout uh, matzo and tomorrow for for us, it's tomorrow, um, pretty soon, and well, well, sooner than you guys, um, Bikarim. And uh, so, yeah, we'll go ahead and get into the scriptures here. So, um, I'll read Leviticus 23, verses 9 through 14, and that's the commandment about the feast. So, Leviticus 23, 9 through 14 says, and Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before Yehovah to be accepted on your behalf. Excuse me. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day, when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to Yehovah. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to Yehovah for, sweet, for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering shall be of wine, one fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your Elohim. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Amen. Um, I'm going to go over to the Hebrew really quick with you guys. So that word first fruits in the Hebrew is uh, reshi. And it's the same word that is tied into beta sheep that's used in Genesis. Like it, it means beginning, um, first, best, the uh, chief or choice part. Um and if, if we look into what a sheep is, I was doing a little bit of uh, reading. A sheep is literally a bundle of grain stalks um, laid lengthwise and tied together after after reaping. So like like two big bundles um, that they would have to put together. And uh, sheep in Hebrew here in this verse that we just read is, is omer, which is a measurement of one-tenth of an ephah, and it equals out to about two liters. Um, so that's, that's the exact measurement they would have to gather up, tie together, and bring before the priests. Uh, and then after the sheaf was waved, uh, the grain would be taken in specific measurement and made into bread for the offering, because we know like grain offerings is, is like a meal offering, right? So they would throw some of it, they would, burn, they would burn some of it, and then they would make some of it into bread, and then they would have to bring wine. Uh, and then we read also they sacrificed a lamb in the first year, so that lamb also would have been part of the offering. Um, yeah, the lamb was part of this offering. This was required to be done before anyone in the land could buy, could sell, could even eat from their new crops. That's pretty cool. 
They had everyone had to wait until this offering was made. Yeah. And the part I love, which we'll get into later, that leads into it, <coughs> is when the the wave offering, the sheaf offering, brought to the priest, and the high priest would take it into the Holy of Holies and wave it before Yehovah. It was an acceptable offering. And get into how that ties into Yeshua, <coughs> that part. Amen. So the offering, like I said, it was a meal offering. And this is, to me, this is just really awesome, and the, the picture that it gives us. The, so, like I stated, everyone had to wait to eat the new crops, to sell the new crops, to buy the new crops until this offering was made. So the very, very first meal that was had with the new grain and the land was the meal between the priests and Yehovah. That was the very first meal that was taking place in the land every single year. And that's just, that's beautiful, man. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's, it, it gives us the picture of the priest coming before Yah, you know, as a representative of the people, as a mediator of the people, not only thanking, thanking Yah for everything that they've got, every, all their crops, but reestablishing that, that, because when you eat with somebody, you're entering into a covenant with somebody. When you break bread with somebody, that's what that represents. You're breaking bread. You're having a meal with them. Yeah, entering into fellowship with them. Exactly. And so the priest would do that on behalf of the people with Yehovah every single year with the new crops. You know, reconfirming, we're going to serve you. We're going to honor you. We're going we're gonna to bless you in your name because all that we have is yours. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's see. So... Next verse that we have here, you want to read it? You want to? All right, Leviticus 6, verses 14 through 23. And it says, this is the Torah of the grain offering. The sons of Aharon shall offer it on the altar before Yehovah. He shall take from it his handful of the fine flour of the grain offering with its oil and all the frankincense, which is on the grain offering and shall burn it on the altar for a sweet aroma as a memorial to Yehovah. And the remainder of it, Aharon and his sons shall eat. With unleavened bread, it shall be eaten in a holy place in the court of the tabernacle of meeting. They shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my offerings made by fire. It is most holy, like the sin offering and the trespass offering. All the males among the children of Aharon may eat it, it shall be a statue forever in your generations concerning the offerings made by fire to Yehovah. Everyone who touches them must be holy. And Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, This is the offering of Aharon and his sons, which they shall offer to Yehovah. Beginning, go ahead. So I want to touch on something there. Is uh, reread that part about touching it. Okay. So. Everyone who, do you want me to just read that part? Or, yeah. Okay. Everyone who touches them must be holy. Okay. So we're, we have an example there that's so easy for people to uh, read over um, about touching the, this offering unto Yehovah that has been given to Yehovah and then given to them as their portion from Yehovah. Yeah. And, and that anybody who touches this, this portion, this offering, that for them to eat must be holy must be holy yeah. and Ms. Baha this points of, or paints a picture of you know when when we come before the king when we come before him with our our our, our make Yeshua says that we must be willing to sacrifice ourselves daily Paul reiterates that and and be an offering unto him to offer ourselves in every way shape and form um, because right now there's no priesthood right now. We don't have that that system to right. to adhere by. So we do it in ourselves, and we do it by keeping these feasts as a remembrance and yeah. stuff like that. So when we enter into Pesach and Matzot and and Bikurim and Shavuot and everything, it's it's a form of one being fed by His Word by Him. And, and to handle it, we need to come before him holy. We need to be clean. And I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect and not ever sin again, but I'm saying that, one, you mikvah. And I'm talking about 
like I've talked about when entering in the Shabbat on Fridays, one of the things that everybody should do is take a shower because scripture indicates many times over that if someone's unclean, this or that or whatever, they are to bathe themselves, wash their clothes, and at evening they will be clean. So if we bathe on the sixth day of the week before we enter in the Shabbat, then we, as soon as at evening you will be clean, therefore you will enter in the Shabbat clean. <clears throat> the same uh, application applies here about first physically entering in before Yah in the feast clean. Every one of us, man, we clean this house, got this whole house cleaned and mopping the house and doing all this stuff, making sure there's no leaven. And I think we might've actually did it this year for Michelle and I anyways, in 12 plus years of doing this, we think hopefully we're like open. Don't find a cracker or a cookie hidden somewhere. But, um, and then all of us, you know, getting a shower and stuff and, and getting stuff cleaned and, and washed and stuff before we had dinner and before we did the Pesach meal at, at twilight. And this is a representation of that for us that, you know, right now this is that version of being able to get clean and 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 be ready to present our offering unto Amen. Yah. Amen. And right now our offering is servitude and, and worship That's and right. obedience, you know, um, acting on this thing, keeping these these keeping these commandments Amen. to show him that we believe in all that what he has given us to do. We honor him and glorify him. And, and not of our own way, not of our own doing, but of his way and the way that will make him look down on us and smile, Amen. you know. And so, Mishpaha, as you do this and as you continue on in Matzot or, or whatever, or for some of you who may be getting ready to do Pesach tomorrow, be sure, be clean. For, uh, Paul says first in the physical, then in the spiritual. Scripture teaches that throughout the Torah. Be clean, take, you know, make for yourself and all of that stuff. Get clean and then be clean spiritually. Spend time in prayer and in repentance and everything else so that when you come before you on this feast, on whatever section of it you're on right now, you come before him clean Amen. and holy. Um, you know, the book of Hebrews tells us, just to add to what you're saying, that, you know, we are to offer ourselves as a continual sacrifice, as a continual offering. And like Brother Paul said, you know, it's all it's all spiritual now. People think that because there's no temple and there's no there's no precept that there's no uh, spiritual takeaways or applications that we can get from these scriptures. That's not true. Like Brother Paul just said, there are measures that we can take, there are things that we can do as the living temple of the spirit of Yahweh. True. And in fact that it might even it's to me, that makes it even more serious now. You know what I mean? Because the yeah. temple of the temple of Yah was a place that only the high priest had access to, but now the temple of Yah is within us, and Yeshua had to die for that. Sure. He had to die to give us that access. So how much more are we held accountable? How much higher do we need to have that respect and that reverence? And these feast days, which if the feet, if the if the high priest went to go give even the wave offering or any of these offerings and he wasn't right before Yah, he would be dead. He would, he would drop dead. It would not be permitted. Yah is, is too holy to have that. Yeah. But Yeshua died. So out of, out of mercy, we could have access to this. We could have access to his presence. But that doesn't mean we get to be lax about it. Sure. That doesn't mean we get to be, we get to lightly esteem it. Like, like he said, do the things that you can to make sure that you're clean before your king. And the internal part, the internal part is what's most important. The internal, what's in your heart, what's in your mind during these feast times is even when we need to be more adamant about what we're watching, what we're listening to, the words we're speaking. We should be watching all these things every day. But during these feast days, it's even more important that we do this. It's even more important that we don't allow the things that, you know, bother us or cause us to be agitated. Or, you know, maybe you have an issue with somebody or, or, or you have, you know, these shows that you like to watch that you're not so sure about. During these feast days is now even more important than ever when you just better safe than sorry. Just keep your mouth shut. You know what I mean? If you, if you are having issues with your mouth, 
Don't watch TV if you have issues watching TV. Don't you know? Don't listen to music unless it's music that's glorifying Yah. If you're not right. sure about it, Amen. these are the ways that we can ensure that we are keeping ourselves clean. Amen. And and, and all of this, Mr. Bahar, connects to the obedience that we do in these feasts. It helps. It helps us throughout the year to understand the kind of things that we need to adjust and change in our life. I mean, yeah. same thing with uh, when you enter into the beginning of a biblical year. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that uh, people do, um, I've done it myself uh, quite a few times, <clears throat> is, you know, entering into a biblical year, um, given the first fruits of the year with, you know, fast that first day or the first few days yeah. or, or even the first week you know, fast and, and give that that time of yourself because there's no greater sacrifice than that, that we can ever represent to Yehovah than when we deny ourselves. The the very thing that that medically speaking says keeps us alive, water, food and all that stuff. Amen. When we deny that stuff and come before Yehovah, we are showing him, we are telling him how how much we really want to get his attention. Because I guarantee you, nobody's just going and doing a fast um, spiritually and because it's just, you know, on a whimsical fancy or, oh, this sounds good for this week or something like that. Because spiritual fasting to Yah is spiritual, which intensifies the aggressiveness against the body because you have the enemy coming against you, you have the enemy attacking you. I mean, He's attacking your mind. He attacks your emotions and everything else. And yeah. when you fast to Yah, it's not something you're just going to do because it sounds good today. Now, I know people fast for their own pers pur purposes, for health and stuff like that. That's a piece of cake because it's for you. Yeah. It's, it has nothing to do with spirituality. It has nothing to do with drawing close to Yah and when we do these things, these are first fruits in our life that we can give unto Yehovah. It doesn't, doesn't, it's not just for this day, bickering, yeah, yeah. to do this. There are many different ways of first fruits that we can give to Yah. We give God the first fruits of our paychecks. Yeah, we right. give Yah the first fruits of the new biblical year. We yeah, give. Right. We give Yah the first fruits of our children. He says, yeah. "Your first son, your first yeah. child." will be, you know, they we dedicate it. We dedicate our children unto Yah. You know, all, I mean, all kinds of stuff. It, it's interesting you say that because uh, when I was reading, I found that the, the Chaldean lexicon, one of the descriptions of this word, the sheep, the use is firstborn, firstborn child. So yeah. I thought that was cool. That, well, and like that Anthony was, said early, better sheep is, it's actually a sheep in, in Genesis, but the bay the bait is to reference that in the beginning. So that's what the bait is for, is in. Okay. Uh, so it actually is the same word, or sheep, uh, for nice. beginning, for firstborn, stuff like that. Better sheep is in the beginning for the name of being the first book of scripture. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there's so much that we can learn and understand when it comes to first fruits and how it applies in our life and how we can honor Yehovah with it. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff. So one, one thing that comes to mind while you were speaking as well is I've, I've seen it um, myself and it's just really a shame because I, you know, we know the popular uh, theological argument from Christian Christianity is that we don't have to do these feasts anymore. They, these don't apply to us anymore. <laughs> Yet I've literally seen Christian pastors take first fruits and make it applicable to their congregation and say, you have to give your first fruits to God. You have to, you have to give the offering of first fruits of the year and, and yada, yada, yada. And it's like, it's really sad to see the, the, the scriptures and the commands and the feasts of God be, be used in that way. You know, it's, it's it's so we need to make sure that we don't fall into that category of abusing Yah's holy word, Yah's holy scriptures, and taking them for granted, or taking them and using them um, for our own gain or for our, our own desires. Sure. Honor the word. Honor the word. Yeah, and do what then, it says. Then you come unclean before him when you go messing around with it like that, and you yeah. risk. You may not get put to death right there on the spot like yeah. our own sons were when they. 
played with Yah's fire and came in with strange fire, but you very well could end up you bring in judgment on your head where something can happen to you yeah, that's right. that will mess your life up. That's and, right. you know, there's many different ways that can happen. All right, back to where we were at in the scriptures okay. here. Uh, so, I keep, like we said, the last verse, everyone who touches them must be holy. And Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, This is the offering of Aharon and his sons, which they shall offer to Yehovah. Beginning on the day when he is anointed, one-tenth of an ephah of the fine flour as a daily grain offering, half of it in the morning and half of it at night. So these are the daily grain offerings that they were to make. We're just, I'm just reading this to give a picture of what the grain offering would look like and what it is because uh, the first fruits offering was a grain offering. They would bring the sheaf in and then it would become a grain offering. Um, Let's see, so uh, beginning on the day when he is anointed, one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a daily grain offering, half of it in the morning and half of it at night, it shall be made in a pan with oil. When it is mixed, you shall bring it in. The baked pieces of the grain offering you shall offer for a sweet aroma to Yehovah. The priest from among his sons who is anointed in his place shall offer it. It is a statute before or forever to Yehovah. It shall be wholly burned for every grain offering. For the priest shall be wholly burned. It shall be eaten. Wow. Can you imagine, brother? Can you imagine making the grain offering, taking the grains, crushing them, putting all the flowers and the powders and the oils together, baking them in the temple, and sitting down and eating that meal before Yehovah? That to me makes me think of the Last Supper, the wedding. Oh, okay. And the wedding feast, both of them. Yeah, the Last Supper. That's because they ate before Yehovah. Yeah, <laughs> they sat and ate yeah. with him. And if we truly desire to be in the presence of Yehovah during these feast days, like we had our Pesach meal last night, Mishpah, when I looked at the table when it was all said and done, I choked up. I, I, yeah, I don't, don't, don't believe that he didn't. It, this is joking the because was, he was man, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he, 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 yeah, he, he, he was just it was good, man. It was good, but it's and now and now reading through these scriptures with you guys, um, I, I kind of have just a little small revelation of why because we're literally getting to partake in the piece of what the high priest did. Yeah, we're, just, we're just a taste. Yeah, like to sit. Man, I can't imagine what it must have been like for the disciples yeah. to sit there, and they knew that he was Mashiach. They yeah. knew, they believed. They watched him do miracles in front of them. They, and even though they hadn't quite had all the understanding yet, because it wasn't time till after he rose, but they knew that he was Messiah, and and to sit there and break bread with him. But that's not the first time people have done that. I mean, you go all the way back to Abraham. Yeah. Um, when when the three angels appeared and one was Malach Yehovah, which Anthony and I are going to be doing a teaching on that. Um, but he and he went before him and, and he made bread and prepared a a, 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 a young goat and and cream and, and butter and all that, and presented it all before him. Yeah. Now sit there to to be with him, watch him eat, and, and to walk and talk with him. And <clears throat> yeah. It's the very thing that we're all excited for. It's the very thing that we're all looking forward yeah, to, man. Mishbaha, to be, Amen. to have, to, to sit with our King, our Savior, and, and eat with him, Amen. break bread with him. Oh, Amen. man. <laughs> Did you want to read something? I have more scriptures, but if you want to Yeah, read no, something. I'll wait uh, while you okay. continue in the Torah. Yeah, the we're Torah. just going over the I'm Torah. I'm going to do John 20. All right, so the next verse we'll read is Leviticus chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. And it says, As for the offering of the first fruits, you shall offer them to Yehovah, but they shall not be burned on the altar for a sweet aroma. And every offering, offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your Elohim to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. 
If you offer a grain offering of your first fruits to Yehovah, you shall offer the grain offering of your first fruits, green heads of grain roasted on the fire, grain beaten from full heads, and you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is the grain offering. Then the priest shall burn the memorial portion, part of its beaten grain and part of its oil with all the frankincense as an offering made by fire to Yehovah. That's just beautiful, man. Like, I, some of it gets burned on the altar as a sweet aroma to Yah, and then another part of it gets eaten between the high priest and Yehovah. Mm. And it's just like, man, I just, I don't know. There's a, There's been a, a recent drawing in my heart more and more that we do these feasts to understand these things, to understand the offerings, to understand agriculture and grain and wheat and barley and all these things and, and how how things would have taken place. I encourage you, Mitch, because I study these things out. You know what I mean? I'm not a farmer. I've never worked on a farm. I don't know the process of, of of harvesting and, and, and gathering and all these stuff, but I want to learn why, because this is the, this is the way y'all speaks to people because they were farmers. They were people who grew crops and they were agricultural society. And so to understand these things is going to give us better understanding of the yeah. scriptures when it comes to these kinds of things. I really, so, I really feel sorry for people who, you know, that they say that this is a, uh, a burden or yeah. or to declare that these are traditions of men or of Israel it is for Israel only and man it's just heartbreaking because like you don't even realize what Satan is robbing you from you don't even realize yeah what you're missing out on you're missing out on the very stuff that reveal the heart of Yehovah that's right that's and, so true yeah, yeah I mean it's just man Ms. Bahad, we, this is his heart yeah, go ahead. So what about the salt with the offering? Do you want to talk about that? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no go ahead. So, yeah, because... <laughs> so uh, we read in these scriptures that salt isn't to be lacking. There's all, salt has to be prepared with every offering, um, grain offerings, uh, meal offerings, all these things that was required to have salt. Well, we know that scripture speaks of the salt covenant, as it just did here. And if we look at the... The, the, the qualities that salt has, uh, salt is a purifier, salt is a, preser a preservative, it preserves things. Um, salt has all these qualities, and so if we, if we go through the scriptures and we look at what Yah told David, if we look at what Yah told the Levites, with all this salt being added into all these offerings, Yah is literally telling them that I will preserve this covenant. Yes. I will preserve... I will keep this covenant pure. I will keep this promise clean between you and I forever. Forever. Yeah. So, you know, and when you think about it, you pour salt on a wound. Yeah. You know, it, it hurts. It hurts. It burns, man. Yeah. But it'll clean it. And that's the thing is sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes y'all need to pour that salt on our wounds to kind of. Amen. Straighten us up. It's That's almost true. like a. It's almost like its own refining. Besides the fire and everything, and salt kind of gets your attention. But if there's no salt in there, then it it has no flavor. the The whole thing becomes meaningless because it loses it loses a part of that covenant. And Anthony said it perfectly. It's it's that salt being in there is a, is a covenant that. It will be preserved. It will be protected. It will not lose its flavor. And again, another reason why it's like it doesn't make sense that people would say, "Oh, well, that's done away." But it's like, well, yeah, no. There's just Yah's made too many covenants right. from different angles right. that all tie in to pointing to this thing Amen. that make it crystal clear that none of it's going anywhere. I mean, we, you know, we see it. What's the key ones that we see uh, reflected on during millennial reign? Uh, uh, Ezekiel 45, 46, Pesach, Matzot, uh, Sukkot, yeah. uh, Shavuot, all of this. I mean, they aren't going anywhere. Zechariah 14, Sukkot. Um, these feasts are going to be brought back into place as Yeshua, as the high priest, as the king. And um, 
Levitical priesthood will be reinstated, but with a lesser authority because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. So the high priest of Levitical priest has lost their position, but they will still do the duties of the regular priest. It's okay. Okay. So, um, and all of this is leading to where we're going to be going in John, but um, Anthony's got more to go to cover first. Yeah, so the next the next verse here in the Torah we'll read is Exodus 23 verses 14 through 19, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of break it down a little bit. So Exodus 23 verses 14 through 19 says, Three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I command you at the appointed at the time appointed in the month of Aviv. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. But in the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of end gathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field, three times in the year all your males shall appear before you at Elohim. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. The first... Of the first fruits of your land, you shall bring into the house of Yehovah your Elohim. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Okay, so what this is talking about here, the three pilgrimage feasts, the three feasts that we are to go before Yah in the temple and give our give our grain and our our, our uh, crops to the priests. So the, there's there's actually three first first fruits throughout the year. Okay, the first one that we were reading through these scriptures. The first one is going to be actually, it's, not, it's a little, if you don't understand agriculture, if you don't understand like the crops and the seasons and what's harvested in a season, it's going to be a little confusing. That's why it's important that we know these things. So the very first one we know is Bikarim. That's going to be the barley harvest. And that's going to happen during the time of Pesach Matso. And that's why it's the head of the year. That's why Bikarim's first fruits. Yeah, first, first fruits. That's going to be the first fruits of your barley harvest in the land. And that's why, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're fully convinced that, that the barley is, is a huge part and has to be ready for, for the, the head of the year to take place. Because we just read that nobody could continue on with harvesting their crops. Nobody could continue on with eating or buying or selling their crops until that first fruit offering was given and that first fruit offering was done. So everything was waiting on that that first fruit offering. So the barley had to be ready to, to be cut and to be harvested for that to take place, right? Right. So that is a huge, huge witness to the head of the year. Um, so that's going to be the very first harvest is barley. The very first first fruits of the year is going to be barley. The second that we read, and it uses the term first fruits in here, but it's actually talking about Shavuot. It's talking about the Feast of Weeks. And that's going to be your wheat harvest. So during the Feast of Weeks, they're going to bring in the first fruits of their wheat harvest. And that's why I've heard people ask, like, well, it sounds like there's two first fruits. There's actually three of them. There's three of them. But this bigarim, first fruits of barley, is going to be your very first first fruits. I know that's that's a lot of <laughs> uh, repetitive things. It's a lot of first. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's – and so the third one, the third uh, first fruits is actually going to be during Sukkot. And that's going to be your, your harvesting of your fruit, your fruit harvest. And, and again, the same thing. All these three feasts we, we just read, don't come empty-handed, is what Yah says. When we go to the land, to Jerusalem, we're to bring the first fruits of all of our crops. Beginning of the year, first fruits of barley. Summertime, first fruit of wheat. And then the fall time, the first fruit of our, of our fruit. Everything that we're growing, grapes and everything like that in the land. So that, that's all a big part of it, and I just wanted to break that down for you guys. Um, I was going to read something else, but I don't need to read that. So, and, and as we continue going forward, like we said earlier, even though we cannot partake in these feasts literally today, these offerings, um, all of these things, all of these offerings have so many levels of significance to us. Uh, all of these things, as, the, as we have it in the title, what the representation of first fruits gives all of us is that all that I have belongs to him. 
Yes. All that I have has been given to me from him. As Job said, you give and take away. Sure. We must remember all of that. We cannot allow ourselves to become too attached to anything in this world because he gave it all to us and he can take it all away. I'm not saying don't love your family or cherish your relationships, but even with Job, even with his family, even with his own children, when they were taken from him, he looked up to the sky and cried out and said, yeah, you give and take away. Even our children are gifts to us. Sure. Everything that we have, our homes, our food, our jobs, everything that we have has been given to us by Yah. So for some reason, he takes it away. We have to trust that he has something else in store. He, we have to trust that it's part of his will. We have to trust that he's being the potter that he said he would be, and he's molding us into what he wants us to be. Now, we can also lose these things if we are disobedient, yeah. right? If, yeah. we're, if we become rebellious, if we try to do things our own way, if we disregard his words, then the things that he's given us, he's going to remove his hand, and Satan's going to have his way, and he's going to take them from us. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy so if we're not in line with Yah and His Word and His Holy Spirit, it's like open season on us, man. Well, and, and the thing too that I think the feast, these three key feasts that really uh, reveal to us the layout and and how things go is, you know, Matzo or Bikarim and Shavuot being being the barley and the wheat. It, it represents who we're supposed to become. It represents how we're supposed to be. This. You have the tares that look like the wheat, but tares don't produce fruit. And and the barley is everything unto uh, unto Yehovah. Um, we are the wheat, as Scripture represents us as. And so the spring first fruits represent what we're supposed to become. And then Sukkot, it's so cool because that's the harvest of the fruit, like Anthony just said and read. The harvest of the fruit is the outcome of what we Amen. became. That's right. Amen. Brother. It's it's the outcome. It's it's when, like it says in Revelation, it says that the to swipe your sickle and, and harvest the grapes and and gather them together and everything else. It's the time of the fruit. It's those who produced fruit. Yeah. What we became right. as Yeshua, as our King and as His servants and as the Bride and Messiah. Right. And and ultimately, what we're waiting for when to, to in fulfillment of us being that our whole life represented the barley and the wheat, being the first fruits, and that everything in our life from from the commandments of the first fruits of your of your fields, your job, your life, your <clears throat> children, everything, everything that we were to do, and then ultimately our our mission, our walk, our what we are called to do as people of Yehovah to be a light on the hill, to be sent out to do, you know, Yah said, who will go for me? Amen. And every one of us are supposed to say, here I am, Lord, I'll go right. yeah, and take me. And, and when it's all said and done, there's going to be two harvests. Amen. There's going to be the harvest of the fruit of Yehovah, which is us. Yeah which is supposed to be all of us. And there will be the harvest of the wheat, of the tares yep. that will be bundled up and cast into the fire. That's right. And which one are you going to be? Which one um, are you striving to seek after? Because it's like yesterday. I got thrown in Facebook jail again yesterday because of somebody else. They, did, they decided they didn't like me, so they went and told some lie saying I was... Well, actually, I don't even know what they said because Facebook won't tell me. But I'm as soon as our conversation ended, I got blocked from posting stuff from groups um, that I'm not admin in, and her group was one of them. Um, this lady sent me a PM saying, "Bless be Easter and all this other stuff," and and I nicely <laughs> told her, I said, "I'm sorry, but Easter's pagan." I said, um, "I would encourage you to." research it. I said, I keep Pesach, the feast commanded by Yah in the Torah. And she came back at me and, and said, oh, well, I did that, done that, and and grew beyond that. And I told her, well, I'm sorry, but if you used to keep Yah's feast and you've got, and you traded those in for uh, the pagan uh, holidays of Babylon, I said, you didn't get beyond it. You went backwards. 
Yeah. And and then she just started. Uh, then the, the the her true colors came out. She said, "Well, you've just." brought judgment on your head for speaking against a prophetess of God. Oh my God. So I hit the laugh emoji. I think that made her mad. But um, anyways, the point being on that is because of her rejection of this, but yet she thinks that what she's doing is honoring Yah, and yet her group that she has is called Messianic Bible Study. And Ms. Baha'i, we this is all a part of the difference between being the true fruit of Yah that will be harvested by him at the end at Sukkot or being the fake fruit that tries to pretend to be there that is the, the tares among the wheat and that are misguiding and misleading Yah's people. And, and by our study, by our seeking out like anthony said it's really good to get a basic understander understanding about agricultural um yeah. uh you know crops and and how they work and and, and farming i'm not talking about getting a full knowledge of it, but just getting a basic understanding to where you can understand why yah uses that yeah. um about us towards us yeah. uh to to reflect us yeah. and, and to reflect him yeah and um yeah and so the more this is why the more that we dig deeper in the feast and, and dig it out to understand the greater we understand the whole purpose of what Yehovah has given to us and why it's as relevant and as vital and as important today even doing these things in remembrance yeah. as it's ever been so cool and just to give you guys a, a, a picture of how this stuff would, would unfold, I'm going to read a small little excerpt from an article from the Temple Institute that talks about Shavuot and then these, these offerings and how they would gather them and bring them in. So um, like I said, Mr. Kyle, this is you know, solely we need to understand these, these things and how they did them and, and, and why they did them. And, and um, this is solely to get a better grasp on that so that we can better apply them to us and our lives. Like Paul said, it all has meaning. It all can be applied to, to our lives. So here it goes. It says, uh, it began with the harvesting of barley during Passover and ended with the harvesting of wheat at Shavuot. Shavuot was thus the concluding festival of the grain harvest, just as the eighth day of Sukkot was the concluding festivals of the fruit harvest. During the existence of the temple in Jerusalem, an offering of two loaves of bread from wheat from the wheat harvest was made on Shavuot. In the largely ag agrarian society of ancient Israel, Jewish farmers would tie a reed around the first ripening fruits from each of these species in their fields. At the time of harvest, the fruits identified by the reed would be cut and placed in baskets woven of gold and silver. The baskets would be would then be loaded on oxen whose horns were gilded and laced with garlands of flowers and who were led in a grand procession to Jerusalem as the farmer and his entourage passed through cities and towns. They would be accompanied by music and parades. At the temple in Jerusalem, each farmer would present his bickering to a Kohen, which is a priest, right? Right. in a ceremony that followed the text of what we read, Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 15. That'd be really cool to see, man. That would be really cool to see. To have the celebration of bringing Yah the first fruits of what He's giving you throughout the year, and it, it's Yah says to give with a cheerful heart. Yeah, that's what He says. Why wouldn't we want to? And here, and here we see the people coming, coming in a parade and in, in an entourage of celebration, even decorating their oxen, man. That's so cool, man. Like. Dress, decking it all out, and dressing <laughs> it up, man. That 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 is so cool. So, like you know, like we said, you know, all these things, um, we can we can take away from these things yeah. because every every good thing comes from God. Like James said in James one seventeen through eighteen, every good gift Ooh. and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth. That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Amen. Amen. Oh, man. Want to read that? 
Are you done? Yeah, for the most part. Do you, what else you got? I want to read one last verse in the Torah, but that will kind of become last. Um, it would be fitting for the end. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I, I'll, I'll, once you start getting into that, I'll cover some of this too, because this kind of goes with that. Okay. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to read the chapter, the whole chapter, John 20. And got a couple of neat little things in here that we're going to touch on. Some of you already know this. And many of you who uh, follow this ministry that are brand new right now into this being your first year, you're going to love this. All right, so John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and said to the, and to the other disciple, whom Yeshua loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Adon out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Kepha, Peter, therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Kepha and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Kepha came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there. Now listen carefully, Mr. Bahad, this is really, it, it's just amazing. Um, the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So here's, here's a little history lesson. <clears throat> Jewish custom, and for a lack of better words, um, old time custom is when they, when they would be at a table eating, um, if they had to walk away from the table and they weren't, they weren't leaving, leaving, they would take their napkin, they would fold it up, and they would lay it next to their plate. It was an indication and a sign that they're gonna come back. If, if it was just balled up like this and tossed on the plate, that was an indication that they were done and they've left. Mishpaha, there is a reason why Yeshua did that. Yeah. Because of the custom that was common um, among Israel, among the Hebrew people, he folded up the, 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 the wrapping around his head, folded it up separate from all the linens that his body had been wrapped in to give an indication that I will return. Amen. I'm coming back. Amen. All right. That's awesome. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he, had, he must rise again from the dead, then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Yeshua had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Adon, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Yeshua standing there and did not know that it was Yeshua. Yeshua said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid them, and I will take him away. I can only imagine what his voice sounded at this very moment when Yeshua said to her, yeah. Marion. Yeah. <laughs> what it must have just like electricity had to have gone through her body. I, can, I mean, just the thought of it does it to me. I got goosebumps all over my arms. She turned and said to him, Raboni, <laughs> which is to say, teacher. <laughs> she must have shouted it, man. <laughs> She must have turned oh, and crazy, yeah. just, it just probably came out just like, ah, like almost like a, yeah. 
a joyful anguish if that is possible, you know. And, Yesh yeah. and Yeshua said to her, <clears throat> do not touch me. Do not cling. It says cling, but the correct translation, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my Elohim and your Elohim. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen that she had seen the Adon and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, I'm, I'm going to go back to the don't touch me part. I'm going to lead into it here in a minute. Yeshua came and stood in the midst and said to them, Shalom unto you, peace unto you. Hallelujah. Again, another moment that must have just been, that room must have just filled with just, the only description is just electrifying what the presence of him must have been the minute they heard his voice. I mean, you know, my voice, my sheep know my voice. That's right. As soon as he said, Miriam, she spun around, Rabboni! Yeah. You know, she yeah. knew. And, and when, the, when he spoke, when he said this, he showed his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw Yehovah. So Yeshua said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them wow. and said to them, Receive the Ruach HaKadosh. Wow. That right there is an indication. People think that there's this is the difference between receiving the Holy Spirit, like Yeshua just gave to them, and being baptized and the Holy Spirit, like happens to them at Shavuot, okay. right there, all right? But that's not what I'm touching on. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, Thomas called the, called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Yeshua came. The other disciples, therefore, said to him, We have seen the Adon. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Yeah. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Yeshua came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Adon and my El. Yeshua said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have seen and who have not seen and yet believe. So here's the thing I want to share. There's two things right here, Mishpaha. So Thomas is touching Yeshua, but Yeshua just eight days earlier told Mary Magdalene, don't touch me. And why is that? Because on that day, the day that he rose, it was the day of first fruits. It was Bikarim. Yes. Yeshua had to go and present himself on yes. the father. Yes. So when, she, when he <clears throat> told her to go tell the disciples that I am alive, while she went to do that, Yeshua went before the Father in the throne room and presented himself as the first fruits of the wave offering, right. that barley, that, that right. wheat offering, all of that. He presented himself as that wave offering yes. Yes. before Yehovah as the perfect sacrifice, as, as the first fruits of what ultimately will be the fruits of all that become and do everything to be an image of Yeshua at Sukkot yeah. resurrection, at Sukkot harvest of the fruits, yep. okay? So he was the first fruits because in other scriptures says that they were, that he was the first fruits and there were others who rose with him or after him that day, okay? 
but we're not getting into that. The, the point is, is this is the first fruits of the resurrection. All right, before you read that, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, but each one in his own order, Messiah, the first fruits, afterward, <laughs> those who are Messiahs at his coming. Exactly. All right, and then the second thing is, is this. I see a lot of believers, they're like, I just, I, I'm always hearing, if, if y'all would just give me a sign. You know, everybody wants a sign, here's a sign. Well, you know, it's kind of like the running joke that says, drove into, this guy drove into a gas station with a flat tire. And the tenant came out and said, got a flat tire? Guy goes, nope, the other three just swelled up on me. Here's your sign. <laughs> okay. We cannot handle God like this. Yeah. We, we, if we want to see the miracles and the power and the authority, if you want Yeshua to breathe on you, the Mishpaha, you got to believe. Uh -huh. You got to believe because you know in your heart and in your spirit that everything that you have come to learn about him is the truth. But a part of that belief is to, I'm going to say this again, stop listening to people who question the authority of the word. I don't care what they think they're doing or if they think they're doing something right, they're doing wrong. They're sinning against Yehovah because they are causing anyone to remotely challenge, question, or doubt the authenticity, the authority, the infallibility of the word of Yehovah from Genesis to Revelation. And with that, let us not be like Thomas, as we've all heard in our life. You don't need to see to believe. You need to trust. You need to prepare the field in faith. There's a movie called Faith Like Potatoes. I love that movie. So do I. Yeah. It's a true story. Powerful. This man, he, he had a serious temper issue, man. This guy is always wanting to beat up the locals because if they even mess something up, they're always, he's always beating everybody up. He had real anger issues. Long story short, he came to receive Yeshua as Messiah. He lived in, in Africa, and we all know about the droughts and everything else and what goes on. And what was laid on his heart is he wanted to gather all the people because they were going through a massive, massive drought. And he wanted to gather all the preachers, all the local pastors, all the people, all those who claim to be believers and everything else, all the farmers. He gathered them all into a stadium that he couldn't afford to pay for, but yet got. And he talked about that. He, he quoted the scriptures that says that if, if my people will repent of their sins and turn from their wicked ways, that I will heal their land. That was his old stance was that scripture on everything. And he says, I am going to plant a field. I'm going to go and he, and potato growing you don't know if you have a crop right. until you dig it up. Yeah, you have these the big mounds. <clears throat> you have these big mounds of dirt, and, and everything's underneath. And you don't know if you have a crop until you the day that you start digging and you start pulling up to see if potatoes are underneath. Potatoes grow underground. They don't grow above ground. So he's telling everybody, I'm going to grow a crop, and he's wanting everybody to stand in faith with him. Yeah. And so he plants his whole crop, and man, all kinds of stuff. Neighboring fields is burning to the ground, and I mean all kinds of stuff. And everybody's telling him he's nuts, and nothing's going to happen. And even in the process of all of this, his, his youngest son dies. His son falls off the tractor and is ran over by the big back wheel. And I'll tell you something, I was weeping, man. To go, to, to lose what he lost and to go through what he went through. But he wouldn't lose his faith in Yeshua. He wouldn't give up his faith. And the day before, the actual day that the harvest, even one of his servants came up to him and said, should we just poke up a little bit and just see? He said, no. <laughs> Tomorrow's the day. He said, we will harvest tomorrow. And they went and they harvested the next day. And it was the biggest potatoes anybody around had seen yeah. for years and years. I mean, these were some big, massive potatoes they were pulling out of there. 
And Ms. Bahab, this is how our faith works. This is how our walk works in Yah. This is how it works, is that no matter what the physical around us, it's like us here. I'm, I'm telling you, we've had believers here, Ms. Bahab, just in the past week, two different believers. And, and one, well, I'm not even gonna say, because I don't wanna, anyways, one is very well known. I mean, just put it that way. But uh, two different believers who told us, you can't do anything because you they will get you kicked out of the land. You have to be quiet. You can't say nothing. You can't do this. You can't do that. It's impossible to be here permanently and stuff like that. Um, you know, and it, all this stuff. These, this is what was said to us, Ms. Baha. And what we said to them was, if we have heard from Yah, and it's Yah's will for us to be here, there is nothing man can ever do to stop it. It's impossible to change that. That's exactly right. No man has authority over the power of Yehovah when it is his will. And we believe without question, without doubt, we have had evidence after evidence after evidence that has proved that everything that we have done in this move to come to here, to be in the land, has been by the hand of Yehovah. And nothing can stop it, Mishpaha. Nobody, do not pay attention to the things around you, to what man says around you, to the physical around you. Don't be the proverbial doubting Thomas. Yeah. Don't, need, don't be the one who has to see it happen yeah. before you're willing to move. Yeah. Either you believe that Yehovah is God of all creation, or you don't. If you do, then start acting. Prepare the field of faith like that man did in, in, with the crops, with the potato crops. Prepare the field of faith like so many people do. When, when Yeshua merely spoke the words to Kepha and said, get out of the boat and come to me. And he just stepped out and started walking on water. Be, have that kind of faith in Mishpaha. This is what First Fruits is about because he's alive. Yeah. <laughs> he's alive. I love that song. I listened to the David Phelps version of it last night. He's alive. Man, it just, yeah. Read verse 29 again. Please. So Yeshua said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed me. Blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. <laughs> those are from those are words from our Messiah. Yes, those are the words from our Messiah. That's us. That's all of us. That is all of us who profess His name. That is all of us who profess He is risen. We believe, That's right. even though we have not seen. Him. That's right. Faith like potatoes. Amen. <laughs> all right. With that, I want to I want to read something pretty 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 cool here too. Um, so this. And it all it all ties into the harvest and to the resurrection. This here is uh, from the temple, its ministry and services by Alfred Edersheim. It's a, it's a book, and it says regarding the, the 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 first fruits, regarding the feast, regarding the offerings. Now this now this Passover sheep was reaped in public the evening before it was offered. So, and you'll find that in rabbinic literature as well, that during the Shabbat, once the sun started going down, they went to go reap the harvest to prepare the offering for the next day. Um, and it was to witness this ceremony that the crowd gathered around the elders who took care that all was done according to traditionary ordinance. So here he notes that the offering was prepared the day before, after Shabbat, leading into the evening. This would have meant that the wave offering was being prepared to be waved just as Messiah was being prepared to be resurrected. All of it taking place at once, simultaneously. The priests out there, the men out there in the fields, preparing the crops, cutting them down, bundling, getting, getting things ready, selecting them, while Messiah was in his grave. In Sheol, as it talks about, taking the keys away. From Hasatan. From Hasatan. <laughs> De defeating Destine. Being prepared to be risen up. That's right. By the Father. 
Yeah. So, man, praise y'all for that. Um, any other scriptures you want to read before I read this last one? No, go for it. All right, so this last scripture that I'll read with you guys as a, as a closing scripture is going to be Deuteronomy 26. And I'll read from verses 1 through, uh, let's see here, 10. Okay. <clears throat> now, when you look into first fruits and, and, and uh, the offerings, you'll find in like the Talmud and the Mishnah that there's been man-made things added. So you'll find that uh, the, the rabbis have added different fruits to take with the offering. They've added also different sayings to say when the men give uh, the offerings to the priest. Um, and it's well known that these things have been added. But scripture has its own declaration of what to say. When the, right. when the men were to give the offerings to the priest, there was a specific thing that they were to declare that day and that time. And we're going to read that here to close out because I think it's awesome. Um, so, and it says, And it shall be when you come into the land which Jehovah your Elohim is giving you as an inheritance, and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you shall bring from your land that Jehovah your Elohim is giving you, and put it in a basket, Go to the place where Yehovah, your Elohim, chooses to make his name abide, which we know is Yerushalayim. And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to Yehovah, your Elohim, that I have come to the country which Yehovah swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of Yehovah, your Elohim, and you shall answer and say before Yehovah your Elohim, My father was a Syrian about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to Yehovah Elohim of our fathers, and Yehovah heard our voice, and looked on our affliction, and our labor, and our oppression. So Yehovah brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and with an outstretched arm, with great terror, and with signs and wonders. He has brought us to this place, and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land, which you, O Yehovah, have given me. Then you shall set it before Yehovah your Elohim, and worship before Yehovah, your Elohim. That's beautiful. <laughs> man. All that we have is His. Yes, sir. All of it, Mishpah. <laughs> all of it. May we reflect on all that He has delivered us from. May we reflect on everything that Messiah defeated on the day of His resurrection. All of the bondage that has been broken, all of the chains that have been broken, all the way going back to our ancestors in slavery in Egypt, all the way going back to the beginning of time. It doesn't matter what, what you've gone through, generational curses, what your, what your fathers have done, your forefathers, if we have true repentance, if we truly afflict ourselves with anguish and cry out to him and are thankful for what he's done for us and we surrender all of our hearts, we can be set free. <laughs> we can be set free. We have this. This deliverance. Amen. And, you know, I mean, Mishpaha, just like Egypt is the example. Yes. We were all in bondage to sin. Yes. And even though some ignorantly say that uh, keeping the Torah is bondage, I'll take that bondage. Yeah. I'll take being in bondage to Amen. Yehovah's That's Torah right. over something. bondage to Satan any day That's because right. bondage to Satan leads to the lake of fire. If being in bondage to Yehovah leads to being with Yehovah, then chain me up That's and, right. and sign me up for that deal. Because even Paul said, yeah. I am a slave exactly. and in chains to Messiah. Yes. And he was happy about it. Yes. And so are we. And Mashiach told us to keep sure. his commandments. That's exactly right. Because he, he's the one that gave them to us. Yes. He's the one that gave that met Moshe on Mount Sinai and gave him the commandments and throughout the wilderness told Moshe what to write and everything to write the Torah all came from Mashiach. So Mishpaha, don't be in bondage to Hasatan. Be in bondage to Yehovah because it's all his anyways. That's right. Amen. Amen. 
All right. Well, we love you all, Mr. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Um, hug, hug, uh, uh, Matzo. Um, wow, Sameach. Hug, Bikurim, Sameach. Yeah, all that. Because he's alive. He's alive. That's right. He's alive and unforgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. <laughs> I won't sing it because then right. you'll all shut it off. <laughs> we love you all, Mr. Shabbat Shalom, Shalom, Shalom.